the purpose of Jesus was a kingdom on earth in the hearts of men. Rediscovering the kingdom will defy almost every concept you have about religion. The message of Jesus was a message of a kingdom from heaven on earth. That was the message of Jesus. Your thinking will be rearranged and your life empowered as Dr. Miles Monroe shifts the focus away from religion toward the ultimate issue, the kingdom of God. Jesus came to restore these kings who lost their kingship and their kingdom. Let us now join the seminar in progress. In the 21st century, practical contemporary kingdom living in the 21st century. I'm going to give you an address because this is a convention that was convened to bring believers together from many different countries who have a desire to tap in to God's current agenda so that we don't continue to do business as usual but rather do what is important to God. This building is called the Diplomat Center for a reason. We did not name this building the way traditional religious organizations name buildings. The reason why that was intentionally not done is because we did not want this building to produce religious people. This building is called the Diplomat Center because that term is taken from the official designation given to a person who is appointed by a government to represent that government in another territory. The title given to that person is ambassador. This designation is the same designation given to you who are believers by your government in the constitution that sits on your lap tonight called the Bible. The Bible specifically stresses that you are ambassadors representing Christ and his kingdom government. Therefore, being an ambassador, you are recognized as a diplomat. A diplomat usually carry out his duties in a building called an embassy. An embassy is always the property of the country that it represents. An ambassador is not a religious person. An ambassador is even more than a political person. An ambassador is a personification of the country that he represents. And therefore, this meeting is called by an invitation sent to you from the government of heaven to call you to this diplomatic center to gather at this embassy to discuss kingdom issues that are on the agenda of our government and we must think properly in response to the message. We represent the government of heaven on earth. So earth is not the source of our government. An ambassador's government is never in the same country as the ambassador. 
And therefore, we represent a country and a government that is not of this world. But we've been sent into this world to represent that government and its interests. And therefore, we have no right to represent ourselves. If you ever speak to an ambassador about an issue, those of you who are acquainted with the diplomatic corps of which I am a part here in my own country, one of the things you will be trained to think is that you never speak and give your personal opinion. And this is still not understood by those who represent heaven. An ambassador never gives his personal opinion. As a matter of fact, it is not proper for an ambassador to ever share his personal opinion in public. An ambassador only speaks in this manner. And I quote, My government's position is, and then he speaks. If you were to study the, the mode of representation by the chief ambassador who was on this territory 2,000 years ago, and you were to analyze his speech, you would hear him speak like this. I quote, I say nothing of myself. But I only speak what I hear my government say. I believe one of the principal reasons why we have not been effective nor successful in representing our government is because we keep given the territory our opinion on issues. We make our job difficult when we give our opinions. Because when you give your opinion, you must also defend it. But the easiest job in the world is the job of an ambassador. Because an ambassador never has to be original. You should take notes at this point. An ambassador simply repeats what he's been instructed to say by his government. Therefore, when issues arise, like the use of cell stems or stem cells for research, you don't give your opinion. You must discover what your government position is on tampering with products of the womb. And so, we must think correctly. The state of our world today is cause for great despair. Fear and anxiety, both personally and nationally, have caused depression. Globalization has placed the economics of the world in a very fragile balance. Politically, the spirit of unrest and confusion and instability prevails in every continent of the world. Have you noticed? Even in the great democracies, there is instability. The anti-globalization movement is gathering momentum, causing fear and anxiety among those who feel helplessly caught in a global tide of convergence of the postmodern change. 
global health epidemics such as AIDS, poverty, and related diseases are creating an atmosphere of desperation. In our own country, the Bahamas, I am very sad to say that we have been rated number three per capita for AIDS epidemic in the world by the United Nations statistics. Then there is the plight of our youth. There's labor unrest, escalating crime in every community. Students killing their teachers now. And children killing their parents. The drug trade, corruption in every sphere, even religious intolerance have become a major issue. Ethnic wars where people kill their neighbor because they don't speak the same language. Racism is still alive. Abuse of the weak is present. These are only some of the challenges of the 21st century world that you claim to represent the kingdom of God in. I ask you, do you have the stuff to deal with that list? Added to this complex web of social problems is the advent of the computer age technology. And yet, with all of its assets and advantages, it has improved the pace and the coverage of communication, but it has not improved the quality of the news we convey through that communication. In fact, what computer age has done is it allows bad news to travel faster. These challenges are further compounded by the global explosion of other natural disasters such as earthquakes in unexpected places now, farming and hurricanes and floods and cyclones which daily devastate and displace millions of people without homes and food. And the most recent addition to our planet's worries and woes is the current debate over the value and sanctity of human life. The challenge of the questions of human cloning and abortion and now stem cell research have become top news. Could you imagine we as a scientifically advanced society, priding ourselves on our civility, are now considering sacrificing our own children for our own personal benefit. Are we any different from the ancient tribes of the Canaanites? And the Babylonians who offered their children on the altar of sacrifice to appease their deities to protect their own interests? Is that any different from taking an embryo from a womb and sacrifice it for your own survival? The recent announcement by the most powerful leader of the free world to give governmental sanction to the use of human embryo for scientific research should send a shock wave through the sea of our consciousness if we have any left. Today we are permitted to use dead frozen embryos but tomorrow we must use living ones from the wombs of poor third world women desperate for financial security. In essence, once again, the poor countries will be taken advantage of. And you hear me clearly. The poor countries will not only be dumping grounds for poison food and nuclear waste and conduits for illegal drugs. We're not only going to be the dumping ground of 
criminals. But now we're going to become a fertile field for harvesting human embryos to furnish immoral scientists in civic countries with resource material. And the saints still don't understand what I just said. At this point, I must stress that any question that has to do with the dignity and the value of human life takes the debate out of the realm of science and puts it in the sphere of morality. Morality is a spiritual issue, not a scientific one, and therefore it must be left to the dictates of the Creator, not man. If this be so, then the abortion, the cloning, and the stem cell research issue is a spiritual issue, not a scientific one. And if it is spiritual, then those who represent the government of God, the Creator of all life on earth, and I'm speaking about you, the church, then we must speak out on these issues. I declare without compromise tonight to this gathering of believers from around the world that whenever science clashes with morality, science must bow Amen. to morality. So what are the answers to these challenges? What is the solution to all these problems that we're grappling with? God's response to man's problems from the beginning was literally out of this world. In essence, God's conclusion was that man's problems and his needs could only be met by an invasion from another world. That world is called heaven. Amen. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he did not call an election. But for God so loved the world, he sent someone into it from another world. One of the most powerful statements declared by this principal representative, his name is Yeshua, Amashiach, uh, English, Jesus Christ, sums up God's solution. And I quote Jesus, my kingdom is not of this world, and I am in this world, but I am not of this world, end quote. What a quote. These statements imply that the future of the world and mankind is only secured in submission to the kingdom from another world. The entire message and focus of the Bible and the work of Jesus Christ was and still is the kingdom of God. The answer to the world's condition is the kingdom of God. This year's convention will focus on this principle and most important issue of the kingdom of God. Religion is God's number one problem. Always has been, always was, and seem as if still is. Religion has become more important than the kingdom of God. And yet, in this new century, God has had enough. God is now desiring to restore the priority, the power, the position, and the credibility of the kingdom of God in our everyday life experience. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Amen. 
we're still in religion saying it's coming. In this year's convention, we will address this practical issue of this kingdom and how it impacts our daily lives now on our jobs, in our homes as housewives, in college and high school as students, we are going to look at the reality that the kingdom of God is not some imagination that you add to your religion, but it's a practical necessity for survival every day. The kingdom of God is relevant to your government and your homes and your families. And until we get this right, we're going to be nothing but a religion that talks and nothing happens. This week, we expect an encounter that will equip us with the knowledge and the wisdom and the courage to apply the principle of this great kingdom to all of life and to demonstrate the power and the, and the authority of another world in this world today. Amen. Today, we are not here to focus on evangelism. And I'm sorry if you got a problem with that statement. This is a convention of believers. We're not here to get lost in a religious ecclesiastical celebration for some mood and some emotional experience. No, but we are here to look at ourselves as a universal church and to ask ourselves some tough questions, brother. We are here to submit ourselves, yes, and can I say it? We are here to submit the body of Christ to its overdue generational checkup. Something is definitely wrong with the body. We are sick, anemic. How dare we claim to represent the God who made the universe and we build these buildings on every corner and we call them his church. And in every community where there's a church, AIDS is increasing, drugs is increasing, homosexuality is exploding, prostitution has free uh, loose on all society, broken homes are everywhere, including the pulpit. Tell me the body is not sick. How can a pastor today tell a married couple to stay together when he's been married four times? Something is definitely wrong and we are afraid to admit it. But in this convention, throw your fears away. Let's get it on. Let's be honest and say something's wrong. Let's find out what it is. And you better respond to me now and say amen. I am getting too old to pretend I'm doing good. We need to take an honest look at the church. Yes, the one you claim to be. And if we are, you will see that we are busy, but not effective. We are active, but not progressive. We build buildings, but we can't build nations. We preach to ourselves while the world goes to hell. We proclaim a power that is seldom manifested and promote a king who does not seem to have a real, relevant, and practical kingdom. What is this? We claim to be ambassadors, but it seems we don't know the, governor, the government we represent. We claim to be ambassadors, and we don't seem to know even the country we're supposed to represent. I believe that deeply embedded in this present channel challenge is a call from heaven to the earthly church to stop. I hear a loud sound from heaven saying to the church, just stop. And then take a look at the seven most important questions of any enterprise. I'm going to give you the questions we got to deal with in this century. You mark my words. These will be the questions. 
Number one, what is the church? Number two, what is the original message of the church? Number three, what is the original purpose of the church? Number four, who is the market of our business, the church? Number five, what is the original goal of the church? Six, what should be the method of the church's business? Seven, what is the original mandate of the church? And eight, what is the ultimate destiny of the church? These are tough questions. We've got some very distinguished people here. And they are going to attempt to deal with some of these questions. But today I want to put a few thoughts up on the screen, if I may. And this will be so that you can see some of the things you want to talk about this week. I want to focus on the practical contemporary kingdom life. I want to begin with a few thoughts that may be helpful. There's a statement, and I want to talk about what was the assignment of Jesus. Matthew 4.17 is the first public statement made by Jesus. And it says, after he came out of the wilderness, full of the Holy Spirit, after he was tested and passed his test, he began his earthly ministry with this statement. And I'm going to read it. It says, from that time forward, Jesus began to preach. What did he preach? Repent, he says, for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. His first statement in his public ministry, as in all good leaders of organization, is his vision statement. His vision statement is clear. He said, let me begin, and let me set the record straight, why I came to earth. He said, for two things. One, I came to make you repent. The word repent does not mean to come forward in a church and bring up your past. The word repent means to change your mind, to change the way you think. In other words, his first vision statement was, I came to work on your mentality. And number two, because the kingdom of heaven has come to earth. That implies two things. One, the mind you have can't work in the kingdom. And number two, the kingdom demands a new way of thinking. Or should I say to those who are intelligent, an old way of thinking. In Luke chapter 4, this next scripture blew my mind. It says, verse 42, But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns. Why? Say it loud, everybody. Why? No, read. Why? I can't hear you. No, say it loud. You're supposed to be in church. Say it loud. Why was he sent? Read it loud. I can't hear you. Why was he sent? And why did he preach that? Because that's why he came. Why means purpose. Why means motivation. Why means motive. He's saying the reason why I came is to preach one thing, to declare one thing, and it's what? The kingdom of God. He didn't come to bring a religion. He came to bring a kingdom. I'm telling you, friends, 
What is the assignment of the church? Now we know his assignment. Let's see if we know ours. It says in this book of Matthew chapter 24 verse 14. Christ is speaking to the believer. He says, and when you go, remember this. This gospel of what? The kingdom will be preached. Where? In the whole world. To who? To all nations. As a testimony to them. And then the end will come. When will the end come? We know when the end will come. Christ never told us we don't know when the end will come. What he told us is we don't know the day. So stop telling people, pastors, that we don't know when he's coming. We do know when he's coming. We just don't know the day. When is he coming? He's coming when we do something. What is it? Read it. When we preach. Come on, read it aloud. And when this gospel of prosperity, salvation, born again, faith, money cometh, claim it, name it. No. We wonder why he ain't here yet. He didn't even tell us to preach baptism in the Holy Ghost. And so he's waiting for 2,000 years. We are now at 2,000 year point one. He's hoping that in this generation... He'll finally get a generation of people who will get the message right. Come on, look at me so funny. See the message there? I'm going to blow your mind. Hold on to your religion. He didn't say, preach born again. Now, believe me, friends. I was brought up Baptist. And that's our flag. Born again. You can't take that from us. You take born again from us, we ain't got much left. tough question. 